Hello and welcome to the 11th webinar in our Lunch, Learn and Dance Wellness Webinar Series, Laser Safety. My name is Lynn McDonald. Joining me in the chat room is Maria Costa. Anastasia from Salem Dance Company will be leading us in dance beginning at 1230 Eastern. Let's take a moment to go over the functionality of the Zoom webinar. The audio and video will be in the form or be from the presenters only. We have found that also you can access the audio through the computer or telephone, the quality of sound tends to be better when listening from a computer. There is a chat feature where people can discuss. If you would like, take a moment now to say hello and where you're from. If you have questions arriving from the content, please enter them under the Q&A section. As the webinar is only a half hour in length and is immediately followed by our dance session, time may not permit for me to answer them during the webinar. The answers will be posted on our website, along with a link to the video recording and a copy of the slides. This can be found under Education Webinars. I will be sending a confirmation of attendance email after the webinar and will include a link to the page with that communication. I will also include the topics covered and the length of time spent in the webinar, as some people have requested this to send to their professional association. Lastly, I have automatic closed captioning enabled in the slide presentation. If they are being blocked by your Zoom controls, you should be able to select a different way to view the webinar in Zoom, that which makes them easier to see. In this webinar, we will first look at what light and lasers are. We will go through some uses, types, and classifications of lasers. We will finish off with lasers hazards, regulation, and safety practices. The concepts will be presented using basic scientific models. Once thought to be separate forces, as scientists gained an understanding of electric and magnetic forces, it was determined that they were both aspects of one force called the electromagnetic force. Electricity and magnetism, which arise from these forces, are part of the same phenomena called electromagnetism. Combined electric and magnetic fields can be considered together as electromagnetic fields or EMF. Electromagnetic radiation is the transfer of energy out from a source in the form of electromagnetic waves or streams of massless and chargeless particles called photons. An electromagnetic wave is the propagation of the time varying electric and magnetic fields in space. In space and in most materials, the fields oscillate at right angles and in phase to each other, as shown in the animation. One property of electromagnetic radiation is that it travels at a fixed speed in empty space and travels more slowly if traveling through a material. While there are several types of electromagnetic radiation, they are all basically the same, but with a different frequency or wavelength. Their energy increases as you move from low frequency and long wavelength to high frequency and short wavelength. Electromagnetic waves are created from accelerating electric charges, which create oscillations in the surrounding electric and magnetic fields. They have properties of material waves like reflection, transmission, and diffraction. How they behave when they interact with matter depends on their frequency, wavelength, and photon energy which are interrelated. The acronym LASER stands for the first three letters of the phrase, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. This name comes from how a laser works. All matter is made of, ele of atoms. Electrons are found in orbitals around the nucleus. Each orbital has a certain energy level and permitted number of electrons. Electrons want to be at the lowest possible energy level with room for them. If an electron in an orbital absorbs a photon, which has to be at a certain frequency depending upon the orbital, the electron will jump up into a higher energy orbital. When it drops back down, it releases the energy by emitting a photon. The photon will have the same amount of energy taken to jump up. Lasers use this phenomena by stimulating the electrons so that they emit light of the same frequency or color. The traditional laser design is comprised of a chamber within which light reflects back and forth multiple times before escaping. Whether it is a gas, solid state, or fiber laser, the same basic components are needed. 
by bouncing stimulated emitted light back and forth in the media before escaping the chamber, the light comes out with different properties than regular light. The light emitted from a laser is monochromatic, meaning it is all of the same frequency, coherent, meaning that those waves are all in phase, collimated, meaning they're parallel, which in turn means they will travel in one direction without significant spreading. Laser light is unpolarized, but as with any unpolarized light, it can be polarized using filters and crystals. This is very different than typically produced light waves, which are polychromatic, meaning varying frequencies or colors, incoherent, which means that they're out of phase, and divergent, which means they spread out as they travel away from the source. Typical light waves are also unpolarized and can be polarized using filters and crystals. The word laser is used to describe devices of this design, which produce output, which is typically in the visible range, but can also produce beams in the infrared and ultraviolet ranges. This is different from the predecessor of the laser called the maser, which produces monochromatic, coherent, collimated microwaves. Because of the properties of the light produced, lasers have many uses in modern society. They are found in electronic devices, tools, used in research, dermatology, tattoo and hair removal, in surgery, holography, in weapons and guidance systems, and in communications, amongst others. Since the publication of its concept design in 1958 by Charles Towns and Arthur L. Shallow and the first construction in 1960 by Theodore H. Maiman, there have been innovations in the design of lasers resulting in different formats and outputs. The frequency or color produced by a laser depends upon the gain medium used and the design of the cavity. There are several laser standards available with a variety of classification criteria, including IEC 6825, the US FDA CDRH, and ANSI Z136.1. A sample of what the ANSI and FDA standards have in common is shown. As many regulations in Canada are based on the ANSI standards, we will discuss those going forward. To understand the hazards involved with the in the definitions of the different classes of lasers, we need to understand two different types of reflection. The first is specular reflection, which is reflection from a very smooth surface. Examples of where you see specular reflections are where you, when you look at a mirror, a window, jewelry, a smoothly polished surface, or glossy paint whereas diffuse reflection is from a rough surface, for example, from a wall, a book, a leaf, et cetera. You get the reflection of light, but cannot see a mirror or glossy image. This happens when the surface is not smooth compared to the wavelength of light being reflected. Class one lasers are incapable of causing damage. Class one M lasers can cause damage if magnified, for example, if viewed through a convex lens, a telescope, or binoculars. Class one working environment lasers are a higher class of laser in a cabinet with interlocks. Examples of class one lasers can be found in DVD players, laser printers, and geological survey equipment. Class two lasers have a maximum power of one milliwatt continuous wave. They all have visible light emission. Eyes are protected by blinking as we have a natural aversion response. Damage can be caused if eyes are held open. This is something children may do, so class two lasers are not safe for children. A class two example is a barcode scanner. Class three lasers have power in the range from one milliwatt to 500 milliwatts. They are an eye hazard, but not a skin hazard. Class 3R power ranges from 1 milliwatt to 5 milliwatts. They have a potentially hazardous direct beam and specular reflection if the eye is focused and stable. There's a small chance of injury. Some class 3R lasers would be class 2 but are not visible, so they're moved up a class. 
Class 3b has a hazardous direct beam and specular reflection. They are generally not a diffuse reflection ha hazard and are not a fire hazard. Although many people consider laser pointers to be harmless, it is not difficult to find class three and even class four laser pointers. Laser pointers higher than class two are considered too powerful for general use as they may cause eye injury. Class four lasers are an eye and skin hazard. Damage can be caused by the direct beam as well as by both specular and diffuse reflection. They present a possible fire hazard. They also present possible laser generated air contaminant or plasma radiation hazards. Examples of class four lasers are laser light show projectors, industrial lasers, as well as those used in research and in laser eye surgery. You can see that the classification of lasers is built around the different hazard levels. When you look at the typical laser accident breakdown, you can see that eye and skin injuries are the most common laser accidents. When you think about the properties of laser light, you can understand why. Laser light travels great distances without much spread. If there's nothing in its way to change its path, after it leaves the laser, the beam will travel in a straight line in one direction. In order to see light, it must enter your eye. So in clean air, if the beam is not pointed towards your eye, you will not see it. It is invisible until it is directed or reflected into your eye. Infrared and UV lasers are invisible even if pointed directly at your eye. Also, because it does not diverge with distance, the energy a laser beam carries stays concentrated in a narrow spot. An invisible beam that carries concentrated energy great distances leads to many opportunities for injury. Depending upon the wavelength of laser light, different types of effects are to be expected. Infrared has thermal or heating effects, ultraviolet has photochemical effects, and visible light has both. Higher energy UV can also cause cancer but one does not receive chronic low doses of laser light, so it's not a consideration. Beam hazards depend upon the intensity of the laser light, its wavelength, and the duration of the exposure. Different wavelengths of light interact with different parts of the eye. Dangers for the cornea include photokeratitis, which is a temporary blindness similar to sunburn, but to the cornea. It is caused by UVB and UVC. The cornea can also sustain thermal injury, which could be superficial and repair itself in days or permanent deep burns, which may require corneal transplant. These effects are caused by IRB and IRC. Scars are only problematic if in the region of the lens, but they can move over time. The lens of the eye is at risk of cataracts, which are lens opacities or clouding, which may require surgery to repair. These are caused by infrared and UVB. Both visible and infrared A are focused on the fovea, a region in the macula responsible for clear central vision. If they damage this area of the eye, vision will be impaired. Lasers can cause photoretinitis, which is photochemically induced damage to the retina often associated with staring at the sun. It can take two months or longer to heal, if at all. The retina can also undergo thermal burns, which in turn can lead to blind spots, loss of central vision if the macula is affected, loss of peripheral vision if the non-macula parts of the retina are affected, and loss of vision if the optical nerve is affected. Thermal burns are caused by visible and infrared A. Symptoms of eye damage include a popping sound from explosion on the retina, a very sore eye, headaches, excessive watering of the eye, and the sudden appearance of floaters or a black spot in your field of view. Because of the nature of the damage laser, laser exposure can cause, it is a good idea to have an eye exam before working in a laser environment where damage could occur. This pre-placement evaluation of the eyes will determine if your baseline eye health 
so that it can be compared when assessing any possible damage from laser, laser exposure. You should have your eyes examined within 48 hours after suspected laser eye injury. Some forms of damage will continue to degrade with time. Lasers can also burn the skin. The extent of the damage depends upon the frequency and power of the light. UVA may reach the dermis. Visible and IRA are the most penetrating and may reach the subcutaneous fatty tissue. First degree burns affect the epidermis, causing pain and redness. They heal within a few days and do not cause scarring. Second degree burns affect the epidermis and part of the dermis. They have longer healing time and scarring. Third degree burns affect the epidermis, dermis, hair and glands. They have the longest healing time and the most severe scarring. There are a number of non-beam hazards which may need to be considered with the operation of laser equipment, depending upon the type of laser and workplace. Physical hazards can come from electrical hazards from the high voltage power supply, which can be powerful enough to kill, gas cylinders, cryogenic fluids, fires from the electrical source or the laser beam igniting something in the room, high voltage discharges and noise. Chemical hazards can come from laser dyes, solvents, and or the medium used in the design of the lasers being toxic or corrosive, compressed and toxic gases required for operation, as well as fumes or laser generated air contaminants or LGAC created while the laser is in use. The laser plume can contain smoke and debris, which is a respiratory hazard. As well, generated air contaminants can be toxic or a biohazard. Therefore, those laser operations which create fumes or air contamination require precautions such as local exhaust ventilation and respiratory protection PPE. Mechanical hazards can arise from automated or robotic systems. When working around lasers, ergonomics and human factors can also cause workplace injury. There can be limited space to move around and tripping hazards from power cords and cables. Working position should be considered for those whose tasks takes a long time, which could be as varied from the time taken to remove a tattoo to that taken to complete alignment on an optical bench. The use of lasers in Canada is regulated by province or territory. Some provinces and territories have health and safety legislation which speaks directly to laser safety. Some refer directly to the ANSI standards, while others utilize aspects of the Occupational Health and Safety Code to ensure worker safety. Federally, lasers are regulated under the Canada Consu Consumer Product Safety Act and the Radiation Emitting Devices Act, which speak to aspects of the manufacturer, manufacture, importation, and sale of lasers. Because regulation varies by province or territory, we will speak generally to best practices in laser safety. You need to check with your provincial or territorial legislation and regulations for applicable requirements. Safety controls for lasers include knowledge and use of the aforementioned laser standards and laser classes. Depending upon the class of laser in use, there may, or may be need for a safety program which includes engineering and administrative controls, standard operating procedures, and personal protective equipment. The ideal is to have all lasers operate as a class one working environment. However, the ideal is not always possible. So we work towards the ideal by enclosing the beam as much as possible and ensuring the beam stays within a controlled area and is not directed at the eye. Laser control measures to accomplish this vary by class. Class one lasers require protective housing and a label. Class two lasers require all class one measures plus posted signs indicating caution and do not stare into the beam. Class two should have an indicator light built into the housing to indicate when the laser is in operation. Class three and four lasers require extensive engineering and administrative controls, protective eyewear and posted danger signs. Engineering controls are built in methods or structures with the purpose to minimize a hazard. 
depending upon the risk associated with the laser class, different levels of engineering controls are required. Examples are proper warning signs and labels, protective housing, and interlocks. Further measures include keeping the laser in a secure location, having controlled access to the laser area, requiring the use to use an access code or remove key to prevent unauthorized use, and having audible and visible warning systems to indicate later laser radiation is being generated. Depending upon the dangers associated with the laser system, you may want to have an emission delay and warning system, which means that there's a time delay between an audible warning and the beam switching on. Additional measures include remote controls for switching, the use of beam stops and attenuators, and keeping the laser path away from eye level. Barriers used to prevent laser beam and reflections from escaping the control area should be flame retardant. Class four lasers required a clearly marked emergency stop button to deactivate the laser and a fire retardant barrier at entry, such as a door, screen, et cetera, to attenuate the laser radiation. Depending upon the class of laser, there are different requirements for warning signs. Administrative controls are procedures, policies, and training used to reduce risk. They also vary by class. Examples are requirements to authorize workers for laser use, limit access to only authorized workers, provide proper training for workers, and to ensure operation and maintenance only performed by authorized workers. It is important to develop standard operating procedures, including instructions for cleaning, maintenance, and servicing, as well as emergency procedures. Within these operating procedures, there should be a clear expectation to use the minimum required emission levels and to wear the proper protective equipment. PPE is a last resort of protection after engineering and administrative controls. Protective eyewear must be worn by the operator and anyone else whose eyes may be exposed, for example, a patient. They must be the appropriate type for the wavelength of the laser. The wrong eyewear will provide no protection, not even a minimal protection. So if working in an area with more than one wavelength of laser, you may need to change eye protection depending upon which system you are working with. If you wear prescription glasses, ensure that they fit correctly over your glasses. Eye protection is also rated by a term called optical density or OD. You must use the required optical density, which is usually five or greater. Protective clothing is necessary when skin damage is an issue, especially with UV radiation. Masks are used to deal with laser generated airborne contaminants. Ear protection can be used to prevent hearing loss from noise. For those classes with reflection hazards, in order to minimize the hazards, jewelry must be removed. Reflective surfaces, including mirrors, windows, doorways, door handles, and any smooth potentially reflective surface must be covered. Walls must be dark in color and rough in texture. To control non-beam hazards, the following should be required. A clean work area with appropriate cleared space for working, secure cables and power cords to avoid tripping hazards, appropriate lighting, properly secured tanks of compressed gas, limiting flammable substances used in the laser area to only those required for operating procedures, easy access to water and or extinguishers for controlling fires, adequate ventilation, and wearing appropriate protective equipment for laser generated airborne contaminants, noise, et cetera. Additionally, it is the responsibility of the owners of class 3B and 4 lasers to establish a laser safety program and to designate a qualified laser safety officer or LSO to implement the program. Procedures to authorize personnel to use laser provide both general laser safety training and training in emergency procedures, ensure standards are met and regulations followed 
maintain rec records and documentation, and to perform inspections should be included in a laser safety program. We hope you enjoyed this overview of laser safety. If you have any questions about this or any radiation safety topic, please visit our website at www.radiationsafety.ca. You can also contact us toll free at 1-800-263-5803 by email at info at radiationsafety.ca or find us on Facebook. To register, go to www.radiationsafety.ca slash services slash webinars.